Good evening, folks. Um, Tomas O'Shea here, and we're doing another interview tonight with um, with Oshie McConville, the Armagh legend, um, who's a good character, a great. Let me see, Oshie Mac thirteen, Oshie Mac thirteen. Yeah, that's it. Okay, he's coming straight in. Jesus Christ, he's brilliant. Waiting for Oshie. Machine boy, how are you? Tomorrow's first form. Goodbye. You 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 can't wait for the hairdresser to open. I'd say, can you? <laughs> I was going to say, I hope <laughs> hope everybody can hear me over me hair. How's the form with you? Form's good, hey. Form yourself. Not too bad. Not too bad. It's a bit more positive, isn't it? This week, like um, I suppose maybe a month ago, talking, we were all saying for safety and um, you know the bigger picture that GA was taking a yeah, kind of a that we weren't really pushing the, 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 the idea that we'd have a championship but it's actually not fully obviously like, but there is there's a little bit more hope now isn't there well Joe, Joan Horn sort of extinguished all that hope a lot of weeks ago but uh, certainly the way things have gone the last couple of weeks you think that yeah it's it's obvious I mean people are getting a lot looser than, than they were a lot of things are opening up people are out and about and uh, if we're going to have if we're going to have pubs open in the next month or so, you'd imagine that it would be okay for a couple of lads to run around the field together, wouldn't you? So, um, uh, here's hoping, because honestly, I- I've enjoyed being at home, I've enjoyed all those things, but I've missed football, like that's the, probably the only thing I've missed. And let's let's be honest about it, the two of us will probably make a few bob out of it as well when we get back. <laughs> 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 you make a lot more than me. Oh, stop. Uh, any, any, how are the family coping with it? Or she like in terms of the kids and their school age, aren't they? I have, uh, I have three kids. So I have uh, an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and an eighteen-month-old. So uh, two boys are, yeah, they're pretty much loving life, and the wee one's just, uh, she's just getting on. She does, her, she does her own thing. Um, I suppose the the big thing for me about the kids is is the schooling. Yeah. What a fucking nightmare that is. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, people I will appreciate lo- teachers a lot more after this bloody thing. I tell you that. Yeah, no, teachers are go- are gold in our house now, as far as <laughs> uh, this thing's concerned. But uh, we were just trying to do what we can. To be honest, the first two weeks of this, we just left them to their own devices and we let them do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, within reason, uh, day to day, and then and then honestly, you know, we we have no problem. We're I'm lucky where we live. We're quite rural, and um, we live in a nice area, and there's plenty of places to go walking, on the bikes, uh, all that sort of thing. So we're lucky in that regard. We have a room around the house, and the boys. Some days the boys kick football for seven and eight hours. Other days they ride the bikes. Other days they'll be on an iPad and. We, as I say, we try and be as flexible as we can with them because there's no point in, you know, it's not this is not the time to be arguing with them. There's only going to be one winner. I sure I know. The, uh, they're at an age you now where it's hard, I suppose, and, and they take up a lot of time. Did you sneak out for any round of golf since since the lockdown? I've played once. Played once last week with my brothers, uh, and I'm playing again tomorrow. And I'm going to try and sneak another one in before the end of the week. That's two, that's one the first week, two the second week. So if it keeps going like that, at week seven, I'll be playing seven days a week. <laughs> I was just going to say, are you one of these fellas? Are you, I suppose, are you like me, a coward who kind of have the golf arranged three days in advance and then just maybe a couple of hours beforehand? Jeez, I'm after getting a text there, love. <laughs> I don't know, should I go up or not? <laughs> no, uh, <very> well. <laughs> my my wife, my wife was telling the, her mother and father the other day, um, the way I go about getting for golf is I just say uh, about my two brothers I just say the two boys are heading out golfing tomorrow <laughs> and I'll know if she I'll know if she says why don't you head with them I'm away and if she says if she doesn't say that and I just say I fucking, I'll stay a pot <laughs> <laughs> I was on the I booked her own for tomorrow now and I was on the app and um it was my my daughter actually that ratted me out while I was doing it. He's on the app. She said, oh, "Jesus!" So I had to kind of explain straight away. Uh, come here. I talk about football, Oshin. Um, 
management and you've been involved with Dundalk, is it something that you want to go at? Is it something you'd be serious about going at down the line? It's very, it's a tough, like over even a selector's role. The buck stops with the manager. Like, oh, do you like it? Do you enjoy being the man in charge of whatever team? Like you had Cross again as well, didn't you? Yeah, and no, I, I suppose the thing with Cross was there was two of us, was yourself and John Mack. And that worked well because, you know, the sort of stuff we're doing, the media stuff and that, it's very, very difficult to commit to a, a role and be there all the time. Uh, and John was the same. He wasn't sure if he could commit fully. So between the two of us, uh, we were able to manage it for a couple of years. But we only managed it for two years. Um, if I was going on my cross experience, I'd never manage again. Um, but uh, the, Dundalk, the Dundalk stuff, uh, Tomás, you know what, what college football is like. Yeah. College football, is, unfortunately, it's on his last legs. And I love it because we don't take ourselves too seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, we enjoy it. The boys have a bit of a, a, a good time. Yeah. The students at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we basically over the last probably three years, you could count the amount of training sessions we've done in one hand. A lot of times we just get together. We have a good view. In, we have a sprinkle of, of inter-county lads. Uh, we get together. Sometimes we get together and we have something to eat and the boys go off. Because I can see them walking in. You can see them walking in the change room some night and you just go, these boys are, like, any of those inter-county boys are probably already, even though it's October or November, are probably still training, you know, four and five nights a week. Um, you know, pre-season will start with their club shortly after that. It's just mental, like you know. But but at the end of the day, like all I ever seen as far as college football was concerned was let the lads out and play a game. They love it. Lads love yeah. playing college football, uh, and they're just not getting the opportunity to do that anymore. And uh, the rigors of intercounty football has just basically put paid to that. And and college football now, I mean, like if you ask ten people who won the Seekers in the last year. You'd be lucky if five of them knew, and they and five and that that's football people. So yeah. uh, so that's the issue. With the cross thing it was just too close to home. I play with a lot of the players. Um, the the benchmark is winning all Ireland, and we failed to do that. So we we essentially were a failure. We won two county titles and we won an Ulster title, but essentially, you know, we we failed in what we were trying to do, and. Uh, I, I, I couldn't say I enjoyed it. No, I couldn't yeah. say I enjoyed it. Uh, a lot of it was I was enjoying it. Um, I've, I'm, I'm with a, a team in a scheme uh, in Monaghan, which is basically about 15 minutes from where I live. Uh, I've started that. I was with Centristown and me. that did uh, a year and a half, two years with them. Um, so uh, it's something that I, I like. Uh, and I like a different style of management because... I like to think, and I don't want this to sound airy fairy, but I, I like I want to, I want to see the player walking into the change room. I'm not, I, I'm not that worried about you know early on how his fitness is or how his, uh, how good he is ability wise, but just what sort of guy is walking in. And I think that's more important to me now than it ever has been. And I think if you can get that right, then the other things you can put in place. Because if you look at inter county management teams now, I mean. You need good people around you, and there's, there's, it, as far as G is concerned, it may be hard to get, but there's a lot of good people out there, and if you can get your hands on a couple of uh, good lads, and I know a couple of good lads, I've worked with a few, a few good lads down through the years, and um, if you get them in, that makes your job a hell of a lot easier. Like. The culture of a dressing room machine, like you know, when you're inside there, you know that you can't bluff it as a player, as a manager, as a coach, or any of that. If you, you know, you've been involved in so many teams, you obviously had that. You wouldn't have been as successful as you had at, at Crossman Glen, but you obviously had it in Armagh as well. Like, it's, it's just, like, would you go about, would you, from the managers you played under, for the dress rooms you've been in, do you think it's important, you just kind of touched on it there, that, that you have to kind of create this kind of a culture of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, and, but not in a serious level. It's hard enough to kind of set your stall out as a manager, isn't it? Because you can lose it. It is, but I think um, <clears throat> players. If you if you're trying to play, sell players something that you're not a hundred percent convinced on yourself, they'll they'll mm-hmm. they'll sniff it and they'll they'll you know you won't last a wipe in that change room. You lose the change room before you even have it. And 
Uh, Joe Kernan was very good at getting good people around him. Uh, that was both at club level and then to ramp it up when you got to county level. I mean, uh, in, uh, early on, Joe's first year was 2002 and he took us straight away, away to, a, um, to a training camp in the Manga. Honestly, Real Madrid were leaving on their bus, and we were going. We were going into the place, and we were sh- we were in the same accommodation as as them. We had the same chef, we had the same uh, dietary requirements, same food. We used the same facilities as, as they did. Uh, Dave Alred, I don't know if you know who that is, but uh, he was Johnny Wilkinson's kicking coach. He's worked with Park Harrington. Um, and he came in, he did a bit with the free takers for a couple of days, and I got a lot out of what he offered, and, and instantly, you know, something's different, and uh, boys bought into it immediately, and, and by the time we come home from, well, even before that, but by the time we come home from the manga, I mean, okay, we, we, there's like there's no certainty if you're going to go on and win something, but we were a different, we were a different species, and a different, it was a different setup than we had been before. And the other thing I think, Tomás, about change rooms is um, it was very much player-led as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, Joe put certain things in place, but he stepped out of the lane. It wasn't Joe. It was all over you. It was players. Like, you know, we had, a, we had a few boys in our change rooms. And I talked to lads all the time and said, your change room sounds like a dour place to be. But it wasn't. We... we <laughs> We we had we had the crack as much as anybody else, and some of us paid a hefty price for it at times, you know. But uh, <laughs> but but there was enforcers there. There was guys who who just wouldn't let you away with it. Whereas it didn't fall back in the manager, and I think that's where, you know, mm. I think that for me, uh, that's where the strength of a change room is, and the culture of a change room can be told by. Yeah, it is, and it's 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 when the players themselves know they're after doing wrong and they're, they're not trying to duck their head and keep their head down and try to get away with it. They know they've let themselves down. I was just going to say, you were saying there, there's lads in the dressing room. McGrain and McGinney would have had the kind of reputation outside of Arma that they were serious blokes and driven blokes and wouldn't laugh or wouldn't smile. And I got to know them on the Aussie rules, actually. And they're quite... You had a good enough dressing room like every other dressing room. You had to have your fun. You had to have that balance right. Did you... When do you reckon, Oshina was, like you, you touched on it there, the La Manga thing. When did you actually turn the corner? Because we played you in 2002 matches and it could have gone either way. I think it was Morris Fitz in the second game that kind of just settled it with a, with a kind of a goal and a good free at the end. But when did you actually turn the corner and believe that you were going, were you were serious to, to, to actually win it? Like, and To be honest, the most was as simple as as soon as Joe got the job. I mean, lads were contacting me. What's what do we expect? What's it like? Blah blah blah. Uh, like in two thousand and one, we had the two brains over us, and honestly, the two brains took us as far as I think they could take us. But in two thousand and one, we played Galway in Crow Park, and we were late arriving to the match. The match was live on TV, and we were late arriving to the match. We had literally five minutes to get changed and get out on the field. Um, we were laid back out at, at half time, and that was that wasn't the, the two brains' fault. But you knew when you when you entered that regime that Joe uh, had that would never ever happen. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. uh, you, you knew it it had changed and it had come up to a new level. So it was as simple as as when Joe got the job. A lot of people started believing because for years, you know, I'm at. You know, we talk about all Ireland's 53, 77, um, even, league, even in the league. Like, I, I played in the league semi final, league semi finals in 98 and 99, and uh, we just kept going up there and getting beat. We just couldn't win. We just couldn't win in Crow Park. And, uh, you know, that win against the Dubs in 2002 was massive for us, you know. I, I was 77. Was that the last time that our man would have been in Croker? After winning Ulster, uh, I think they were in it in the semi final in eighty or eighty one. I'm not, not So who would you sure. who would you have looked up to? Were you football mad or she growing all the way up? Your whole family, your mom Margaret, is a fierce, fierce GA person. But who who would you have looked up to you as growing up? Now would it have been other Ulster players? Would it have been the Dubs? Would it have been Kerry? Who would it have been? Uh, well, our traditional rivals were down. Yeah, and they were going. They went well, obviously ninety one, ninety four. But if I had to say I was looked up to anybody on that down team in our house, I would have get. I would have been looking for a. 
another home to live in. I went to school in Newry, which was which was down, you know, the heartland down, and uh, it was very difficult. But uh, secretly, like I always liked McCartan and and Mickey Linden. But uh, me, me were 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 a massive team at that stage. Uh, uh, Flynn and Stafford and and and, and boys like that. Um, was it always the forwards you die up? You wouldn't have you wouldn't have a better defender as a hero. No, sure. Anybody can be a defender, Tomas. Uh, I mean, all all they all they are is stoppers. Like, I mean, I uh, my wee boy said to me one day, "Why are you always play me in the forwards?" And I said, "No, you know, nobody wants to be a nobody defender. You just salt. you just you just end up there." <laughs> in two thousand and two, um, Oshin, like you went on that drive and. I was just looking. I, I wasn't sure. Was it six or seven? You have seven Ulsters, right? Jesus Christ! Like that time, Ulster, well, the Ulster Championship around that time, all the time, ever since, is is the most competitive at the start of the year. But for you to achieve that, seven Ulsters, and I know when you come to the All Ireland, did you reckon? Were you disappointed that you didn't get more All Irelands below? I suppose part part of me would be disappointed, yeah, that we didn't get more All Irelands. But when I look at it, I mean, you look at us. You saying about that run in two thousand two, Tomas, we never got an injury that year. Yeah, do you know? I mean, like, when does that ever happen? Uh, and I think one or two, we got a slice of luck in two thousand and two, uh, and we did. We probably didn't get it in other years, and other years we weren't good enough. Uh, I, I still think that Joe comes in in 99 or 2000, maybe. I think we probably would have another one under our belt, maybe before 2002. Um, and, but afterwards, uh, even looked at the Tyrone game, Tyrone were probably slightly better than us. Um, then 04, we slipped up badly against Fermanagh. 05, Tyrone, like we were much the better team in that semi final, and we were beaten and then 06 and you, you destroyed us in the second half of that uh, up in Crow Park in the qu- quarter final I think it was so uh, it was a downward spiral really after 2003 even though I, when 2005 came we looked at times we looked awesome that year and yeah we we still failed so the way I look at it is I think still think we were looking you know, we were as a bunch of players. We were lucky that we got our All Ireland medal, but like, yeah, there was there was a bit more in that team. But the teams were around at that at that time. Like yeah. people talking about how strong football is and the top, you know, the nucleus of the top teams. But winning was tough at that time. Yeah. Us yourselves, Dublin, Galway Dublin were always talking about Galway, um, Tyrone were you know were coming. So like it was, it was tough to win in All Ireland. So we were probably lucky enough. I'm happy enough that we won one at least. Oh, Jesus Christ, one is like I, I coming into that final, we got beat down in in Cork, and we got the back door, and we 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 beat them in the semi final, I think. And geez, we played. Oh, we got we played terribly down in Munster, and we played the most brilliant football that we ever played in our lives. And everybody was saying this and that, and. Looking back and coming into the final, that final we started well enough when we were picking off scores, and then you missed the penalty. And I said, I was even thinking at the time, Jesus, this could be our day here. This could be our day. But in the second half, he toughened up a lot more. But the changing point was obviously the goal. Now I'm still waiting for a thank you card from you because I suppose you had the All Star bags before you got to the final. <laughs> to be fair, but you know, I was marking you, and I you got man of the match. It was fucking brilliant form. But that goal. That goal turned the whole game, didn't it? I like if you. I don't know if you if you've watched the game back in full. Well, no, it, it took it took me. <laughs> well, it took me to. Well, I'm a bit like you. I don't I watch too many of them. But second captains were doing a podcast, and he asked me what I what I what I what I watched the game. It was the first time I'd ever watched it. Like you know, in the weeks after you're watching it, but yeah. you you could be anywhere watching it, and. Uh, and you're watching bits and pieces, and and to be honest, if I was at home now, I'd just fast forward to my good bits. <laughs> <laughs> so that would only take about thirty or forty seconds that day. But um, you, when I watched it back, I didn't have any of the memory. You know, I yeah. didn't realize that we started really well. Then you just took over completely, 
And then second half, I, I, I actually think, I, I didn't remember us dominating as much as we did as far as possession was concerned, but uh, I wouldn't be up all night if I was you. Like, cause I, I think that the reason why I got man in a match was because there's no major other alternatives. <laughs> cause like when I watch it back, Aidan O'Rourke probably was as good a player as we had that day. And I don't, I didn't remember. And I don't remember him getting huge praise afterwards, but uh, he played well that day. But um, the goal, oh, I needed the goal. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I've told this story before. and I, I, I'm not going to bore people with it again. But in 1953, a boy called Bill McCurry missed a penalty. And he was buried. And the priest mentioned him missing the penalty at his, <laughs> at his funeral. <laughs> And I grew up with that. I grew up in our house because my uncle Gene, my mother's brother, played cornerback in that game. And my mum, would she give me advice? She might give me sprinkles of advice. The main advice was keep your head. Don't get sent off before I left the house, like a lot of people. But she, she hated me taking penalties. Absolutely hated yeah. me. She was still... I, 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 I reckon that and she was scarred that much from 1953 that that's the reason why. And then, as I say, that was mentioned at the funeral. And honestly, as soon as I missed that penalty, first thing came into my head was Bill McCurry. <laughs> and I never didn't know the man, never met him. But uh, that was the first thing come into my head because that was ingrained in me since I was since I was very, very, very young. And uh, so I needed that. And we had two sports psychologists with us in the in the change room and one of them Des Jennings um, friend of mine he, friend of mine now um, he said to me take a ball out with just half time run up the hill 16 and stick it in the back of the net <laughs> <laughs> so I just yeah of course I will I don't, as if I don't look like a big enough fucking clown after missing a <laughs> penalty I'm going to do that like and uh, but he handed me the ball in the way out any anyway, but when I got out onto the field I just booted it as far as as far as I could. I, even, I think it might have been in the crowd, I'm not even hundred percent sure where it went. But I just, that was just me just clearing the decks and, mm. and just trying to do something positive the second half. But I was lucky to get that goal because yeah that, that definitely changed the game. It gave us that just that little bit of an edge. I mean we still had a bit to do afterwards but the goal definitely was a that was a major score in the game or their major score in the game. When we had our issues with our man, we had our issues. When I with our issues, I mean, like we found it hard to beat you and hard to get get it over you. Same with Tyrone, and I put it down as a defender. Tyrone and our man at the time had serious forwards, like Clark, yourself, Marzen, the McEntees, like Stevie, uh, Stevie Mac, Stevie Mac. Compared from two thousand. To 2002 had come on so much. He had that physically, and he had that yeah. buzz. Like it was it, for you, when you went home. Oh, she and I always ask this, like because you go home, you get lost. You go into the dressing room, and that's you have it with the group, and that's it. And it's special inside that. But then you're anybody's your your <clears> game for for the next four or five days. Can you remember meeting your mom? Like because I know how steeped you are in football, and would have been so would have been a huge day for her. Like, can you remember? Meeting or was it on the pitch or was it after or was it at the function or No, the first person onto the field to <coughs> me was my brother. I don't know where he I don't know where he came out and he's not the fastest, but he uh <laughs> he he was the first person to come he got me in a bit of a bear a bear hug in the uh in the middle of the field and he was the first person to see him, but I didn't get to see my mum until we went to, we went to City West. Uh and then all the family were around and uh you don't remember as much as those nights as probably you should, but you know, I just remember there was just that warm, fuzzy feeling about it, and and you just—it's very hard to recreate that. But uh, when I met my mum uh, that night, I mean, one of the first things she said to me was like, she said, "I mean, she went weak at half time, and she had to, you know, go out and try and be on her own, like try and be on your own, eighty-two and a half thousand people, <laughs> and every <laughs> and a lot of them people know her." Uh, so she yeah. was trying to be on her own and she was trying to put on a brave face. It must have been absolutely hell for her. She wasn't, like, she honestly said she wasn't sure if her legs would carry her to the toilet. So uh, she she blamed me for putting her through that. But uh, she, like, I'd say she wanted that night to go on forever, as a lot of us did, you know. I, I met her at the, um, at the All-Stars uh, that year, I'd say. She thanked me for... for 
to get new the as well. <laughs> but, um, but after that, the Ulster Championships, like even though we were go- we were actually going quite well at the time, and uh, but all eyes were on Ulster at that time, and the, the Ulster Championship final coming down to Crow Park, and like it, and, and there's rivalries all over the country, machine. But Ye and Tyrone. Could you even, would you go as far, and hate is a strong word, did you hate, I don't know, like, off the field, like, was there just this fucking dislike of even fellas off, like, I'd, I'd drink a pint with, with fellas after matches or whatever, but ye, there was, there was, a, there was tension always there, wasn't there? There was tension, there was tension there, I mean, uh, in the middle of all that, uh, a gay called Col- Colm Holmes uh, got yeah. married, I was groom's man at his wedding, and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, most of them were there during the day, and then the rest arrived in the evening, and uh, it's just I was just running around trying to avoid them. Um, <laughs> but there was no, there was no interaction off the field. It, was, it, it felt very claustrophobic at that time to be involved in that game. Uh, claustrophobic. I mean, claustrophobic because it was front page news and it was back page news in the north. Mm-hmm. And uh, like once it started, we started to go to Crow Park then for all the finals. Um, what a logistical nightmare that was like I mean everybody heading north on the M1 and heading back up the road but uh, but like no like traditionally uh, when you live in South Armagh your your our traditional rivals were down uh, always had been uh, and there was good there was good hatred there and then when the, uh, when the throne thing started then it, phew, it got out of hand completely like you know yeah, geez, it was a, a the final was a hard one to take. Or she the, the what year was that was two thousand and three, wasn't it? Yeah, that was two thousand and three. But actually, for a lot of us, and if you talk to any most of the arm lads, they'll say that oh five because we yeah you played the football. We we played the football, and they they should have beat us in the Ulster Championship. And we walked off the field. We celebrated, and we walked off the field that day. But in the back of our head, we we're saying we're going to have to beat them again if we're going to win in All Ireland, and. Uh, and we didn't manage it, and we like we we kicked us out of it. It's replayed on um, on Air Sport every couple of weeks, and it's it's hard to watch. It's really really difficult to watch. Yeah, do, do you find you said it there with the club and with the management? And I find that fierce <clears throat> interesting because you see it with Nemo as well <clears throat> the success they've had, and if a manager comes in, is they're compared to what they've achieved before, and they're compared, and the county very often isn't enough that you have to go on and win a Munster club and all that. Do you think, and even the, the managers that it came after, Joe and Geezer is inside there now, do you think there's a certain pressure on them and they're compared to your team a bit too much, a bit too often? Or is that comparison there at all? Yeah, no, that comparison's always there. Uh, it's it's quite sickening, to be honest, even as somebody who played in, uh, in that era. Um, it's constantly referred to. I mean, th- that may have been acceptable enough you know, four, five, six, seven years afterwards, but like, you know, it's what eighteen, yeah. soon to be nineteen years. You know, since since uh, since that, like that team's well and all that stuff's well and truly gone. We've moved on to a complete like football. You know, the standards of when I'm talking about standards, I'm talking about the standards to even be a county player. Like that has that has gone up. Hugely, the amount of work that ex- that's expected of you. I don't know why. I don't know why you retired in the end, Tomas. But I retired because of video analysis and bus journeys. Yeah. I didn't retire because I thought I couldn't. You know, I couldn't perform. I, I, I will. I like. I quit Arma in '08, or it quit me. I wasn't really getting much of a look in. Um, I and like I won. I won three All Irons with the club afterwards. I was flying, I was in as good a shape as I'd ever been in. But with the club, you know, it wasn't as constant as it as it became with with the county. And as I said, the, the video analysis stuff just absolutely done my brain and, and I couldn't I couldn't handle it. I understand there's a there's a need for certain but I, I remember being in a in a room in two thousand and eight, the year that I the, my last year, I remember being in a room and uh we arrived at half seven and at half nine, we were still sitting in the room going through video analysis, and that wasn't why I played football. Like so, yeah, it was like I remember the, the same pressure wasn't there at club level. You probably enjoyed club a lot more at the time, did you? 
definitely enjoyed it and you can have the crack with it too like and and to be honest you know if you were slightly off at inter-county level you got found out but if you're slightly off at club level you might get away with it the odd weekend <laughs> yeah I know what you're saying oh, what was I going to say would you ever have picked up Francie because Francie was a kind of a, a guy a character and since like he hasn't given interviews he hasn't given he hasn't spoken to the media but an iconic figure within Armagh but Jesus some of the tackles like I remember seeing footage of the tackle that he uh, I don't even know, was it a, a tackle, like uh, <laughs> an assault he committed on kind of an, What, like, inside in training, would you have been marking him? What kind of a character was he like? Because they're the guys that I, I, I have fierce interest. And in. he was a some player, like, he was a hero with your lads. He was. And you know what? He, he probably didn't get the credit that, you know, somebody else who maybe just wasn't as ruthless as him would get. But honestly, Tomas, you talk about a lad off the field. I mean, yeah. like, he wouldn't have said a word in that in the Armagh change room maybe for uh, ever. Yeah, and, produce and the goods every Sunday, like yeah. And we're, we're cross. Like I, I was in the same classroom as him from when I was five and six years of age. Like and I, like you barely get a sentence out of him. Now you can't shut him up. But uh, <laughs> his actually his his wee fella and, and my wee fella is in the same class at school. But uh, the thing about about Francie was that when he like it, 2007, we played Dr. Crokes in an All Ireland final replay in Port Leash, and he hated the Gooch. Not not hated him. He hated yeah, him because yeah, yeah. he was so difficult to mark. <laughs> and uh, I was captain that year, and uh, at half time, I was ready to to give me a few words before we went out on the field. And Francie started talking, and everybody just shut up. <laughs> and when he was finished talking, I said, "Right out." And that, and like we absolutely blew them away in the second half. And like there's nobody who was going into that change room without having fulfilled what he told us to do. And that that's the sort of character he was. We had characters who talked all the time, every day of training and all that sort of thing. And eventually you sort of sw- switch off to most of it. But with somebody like that says something that's so powerful. But mm. uh, but he just led by example. When you say about him picking me up at training, I remember one night going for going for a ball and 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 he he could have absolutely done me like and I, we go back in we jog back we jog back in the position he says anybody else and they were dead <laughs> and that was it and he 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 talks about having given me the fool's pardon a couple of times when I left myself open and he 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 knew he was a brilliant reader of the game and as I say yeah. he'd say he'd say to me you know don't leave yourself as open as that because you're gonna get done. Because that's what I do, you know. And <laughs> uh, but uh, as a character, I mean, as I say, he's he's more talkative now than he ever has been. He works for his brother's brother's business. At that time, he was shuddering. Uh, when we yeah. went down and we did the <coughs> the nutritionists did the test with the calipers. I mean, Francie'd never been in a gym or a weight <laughs> room ever before in his life, and they checked his body fat, and it was like uh, uh, it was practically non-existent. Yeah, like it, yeah. I think it was it was below four or something, so it was actually on in the on you know they want you slightly higher than that, but uh, and this was a guy who was as I say he was walking on the buildings. He wasn't. I wouldn't say he was looking after his dad or anything else, but he was just he was just solid. Yeah, I remember uh, Paddy used to do that with fellas. Do you know the way you said there that the same guys would talk every night at training, or the same guys would talk in the build up to a match. And Paddy used to had this thing. I think it was very good. Like he he picked the guys, the quieter lads, because sometimes they'd surprise you. Jesus Christ! I didn't realize that guy could talk. No, some guys would let you down badly, and then you say, "Don't ask him ever again." But some guys would surprise you. You're on about the club, Oshin. I find Cross McGlynn, and I've never. I'm going to visit it at some stage. It's just a matter of when. If I, bring your clubs. If, if you could invite me up now for some reason. Bring your clubs. Like Dara says, like uh, you have to send an email just to make sure that that, that herself believes me that I was actually got an official because geez, don't take Dara anywhere. with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're invited. He's not. <laughs> but like what you have created above there, can I? Before he got like you won six, you've sixteen county medals, haven't you? Seventeen. Yeah, sixteen. 16 yeah. Like Jesus Christ! Before that, what was the success rate? Was it just a group that came along? And how, like, the question I'd have is, how did you keep it turning over constantly? Like, how was there not 
was it that there was no other clubs in the fucking Armagh or what? Like, there wasn't. Like, it was, there was, what she had is a template. Like, you had to have something, like, in terms of, of bodies. Uh, and... uh, b- before that, Tomas, we hadn't won a championship for 10 years, before we won one in 97. Up here in 90, 1986, uh, Kieran McGinney, Justin McNulty, uh, and the McNulty and Benny Tierney's club, uh, Mullaban, and the BBC did a documentary on us called More Than a Game. Yeah, and we were, I saw it. we were beaten in the game. We were beaten in the game, right? And uh, and as I say, that was the tenth year that we hadn't won a, a championship, and that was replayed and replayed and replayed, and everybody talked about it and everybody mentioned it. And we played Mullaban in the in the championship the following year, and it was. Phew, it was it was hectic, and we beat them, and that sort of we got a bit of belief from that. From that, they had won an Ulster Championship as well. They'd gone on to win an Ulster Championship just to rub salt in the wound, and uh, and the next year we come back and we won an All Ireland. And how we did that, I think, was a good nucleus of players, a sprinkling of experience, and a lot of youth, and uh, a definitive plan of exactly what we wanted to do. And see, when I talk about a definitive plan, it was simple and it was effective. And part of it was we had four, we had a guy, uh, Colin O'Neill, six foot eight. We used to play him a corner forward, bring him out in the middle of the field. And we had four big men across the middle of the field, two Mac- McIntyres, Anthony Cunningham and Colin O'Neill. And if you're the, in the opposition, if you're the opposition keeper, there was no Cluxons around at the time. It's yeah. very, very difficult to get the ball past that. Uh, we were very physical for the first, uh, definitely for the first three All Irelands we won. We were hugely physical. We wore teams down, uh, but there was a culture in the change room that we had some crack. Tomas, we had, we had, we had great crack. Uh, we had great banter uh, every single night after games. We enjoyed ourselves to the last, but we knew when we had a walk, we had a walk. I mean, yeah. like between winning the Ulster Championship and winning and, and playing in the all Ireland semi final, you're talking about the guts of three months. And we used to we used to take majority of Christmas off. No team would do it now, but we took like lads used to come back with two stone on them after after Christmas. Yeah. And honestly by the end of January it'd be gone and they'd be back to exactly where they were. We had a few guys, Joseph Fitzpatrick, Gary McShane, boys like that. Like they're not household names. But if you talk about lads to train, you know what I mean? To get that, and we had a badness. There was a badness. There was a definite badness and a bit of development about us. But we also, like, we got our players too, like, you know? The fierce talented players. Like, to get that balance, or she and I constantly say it, like, the dubs guaranteed, compared to other inter-counties, inter-county teams around the country, they probably socialise and have that balance a way healthier than most teams. Like, to have the confidence, geez, we can't go out. We can't do that because, geez, we won't win anything if we go out. Not true, like. And very often, can I ask you a question? You won six All Ireland's, which is phenomenal. Like it, it's Jesus at, at club level. Like there was no one to touch you during that period of time. Was the first was the first one different to the rest of them? Uh, it was different because, like, the, <laughs> nobody knew what to expect. We didn't know what to expect going to Crow Park. We didn't get a run out in Crow Park before beforehand. We uh, everything was new to us. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that this this is the way to go about yeah, winning yeah. all Ireland. But every championship match we played, we we went out on the on the Sunday night. We went out on the Monday, and we trained again on the Tuesday, and that was it. So it was out of your system. You know you're back training. Doesn't matter if the game's a week. It's two weeks. It's five weeks. That's the way we worked. And uh, that brought us together so much as a team. I mean, there's there's a lot of like if you talk to boys from Croydon, a lot of good stories. But like there's lads who are sitting in the pub on a Monday. As I say, I'm not recommending it, but lads sitting in the pub on a Monday with ice strapped around their uh, hamstrings and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but on Tuesday night, you were expected to train, and that was it. And 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 nobody missed. You know what I mean? People people yeah. say now about lads making excuses for missing training. I mean. We we made excuses to get the training, and that, and everybody did the same, and every knew everybody else was going to do the same. There was no message. There was just no there was no acceptance of that. You know what I mean? You just 
why would you miss training? You just you know it's on Tuesday, you know it's on Thursday, you know we're, yeah. we're out on Saturday, you know we're we'll a game on Sunday, and you just be there, and that's it. You make the arrangements, and that's it. The commitment you know? was obviously that buy-in that we were talking about at the start of the of the chat. Do you know the like for the club itself, the size like you're on the border there, the size of the club, Oshin, like it, everything must revolve around. It must be fanatical football the way you kept it kept going and now even even your nephews the young lads that are coming still going strong like it has to be everything directed toward is there any is there is there rugby is there hurling is there Nothing. there's no rugby there's no soccer so to speak although uh some of the wee, wee ones will be playing maybe in the dark and near you that uh, at the minute i have to hold my hand up my wee boy plays a bit of plays a bit of soccer in the dark uh it's a wee bit more acceptable than it was but uh, there's no major soccer in uh, in in cross. There's no what hurling. Uh, there's no real distraction. There's no, there's no like there's a gym in the club, and that's you know the only gym in the town. Uh, you know, and everything revolves around that. Anything, anything like socially or bingo or any of those sort of things that that the community is running is run through the club. Uh, and I think like as far as you're talking about success. You know, and that keeps coming back because, like, success has bred success for us. And the young lads who've seen us win all earns wanted to win them themselves, and then vice versa. I mean, that group is is still there, and there's there's still huge. I tell you what, it is. Um, like, there's not a hell of a lot else. I mean, when I was growing up, there was nothing else, but there's still not a huge amount of else. I mean, there's obviously different distractions and different things. Uh, outside of that, but those things, I suppose, uh, have always been society, but maybe not as prevalent as they are now. But football is still hugely important to people here, and like we had the Brits on our doorstep. I mean, like you know, at times it was just we went into the field just to fucking stick the two fingers up at them because we wanted um, we wanted an identity other than we, like I grew up in a, when I went into school in Newry. I mean, I, one of the teachers. Uh, there was three of us in the one class from Cross, and, and the teacher the, on the first day we went into the school said, "And and lads, there's three boys here from Bandit Country," and he was only having it. He was only having yeah, a crack. Yeah, yeah. He was having a laugh. But uh, we wanted to be known for something slightly different than just the troubles, like you know what I mean. And that gave us an identity. Um, and once we sort of found that identity, we found a bit of success. And once we found success, then that was. Sometimes, Tomas, when you're on that run, it's it's fucking harder to lose. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's like winning's just just very very natural. And like I'd love somebody to do the research and count how many games we won by a point because we won a lot of them by a point. I mean, we played Balnan and All Ireland uh, club final in '99, and I, I would I would hazard a guess that they had 85 or 90 percent of possession. And we still beat them. I think we beat them nine eight or something. You know what I mean? Like, they kicked a lot of wides and stuff. But that was just us. We just had that belief that we were always going to get over the lane. Do you know, with, with the, and there's been a lot of talk about the barracks and, and I saw a documentary of years ago. I don't know was it was years ago. Of you and you were just standing at the back of the pitch and you could see how close the barracks was like. But Brawley wrote a, uh, an article there lately and he kind of, the, the, the gist of the article was that the troubles kind of actually focused you in so much to the club. It actually helped the actual growth of the club and the actual, uh, just the community investing everything into the club. Like, did it have that effect on, on me? Like, absolutely. It was an identity everywhere you went in the North. I mean, uh, like, like the British army and, and the intimidation and the um, oppression for years sometimes that that has a, the desired effect and you you just you fall into yourself and you and you uh you're not willing to express yourself and you just say uh, you accept it for what it is once you start pushing back it's a very powerful thing when everybody pushes back together and they're not we weren't using it as a, as a crutch anymore and what joe's talking about like uh, as far as the nose is concerned is uh, first of all identity and then second, second of all, just that fucking pig headedness, just to to keep going. And regardless of what was thrown at you, you were going to win in all Ireland anyway, you know. Or 
you were going to be successful. And for, you know what, Tomas, at, at different times for Cross, uh, success was just putting teams out onto the pitch. Uh, it was getting the pitch to put them out onto. I mean, like the the levels of intimidation at certain stages, and you know, in particular when I was young. I mean, we used to train in Lurgan with Armagh. My first year I was eighteen years of age. Uh, we left Cross at half six. It takes an hour to get to Lurgan for training, and we arrived there at quarter past ten. We got a cup of tea and we went home because we'd been stopped seven times the way down the road. So don't don't tell me that that wasn't orchestrated somewhere along the line. Mm. But uh, when they stopped you, they took the bags out of the boot. They emptied the stuff onto the ground. You were expected to put that back in, and you know that it was that level of intimidation. And as I say, once you started, if you were to accept that and not push back against it, then you'd be lost. But we started to push back against it at the right time. When we did, everybody did. And yeah. as I say, okay, you have, still have to have substance behind that. You still have to have players and that, you know, but we had... Was it ever, was it ever, was there ever a time like that you actually got on uh, on some level that they, they didn't fucking bother you or they didn't actually try to annoy you or... Th- those times were very few and far between. Um, we you used to kick a ball, you kicked it into the barracks, puncture a hole in it, and throw it back out again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and we knew uh, as young lads. This is this you might find this hard to believe, but as young lads, um, we knew depending on the color of the hats how bad the intimidation was going to be. And what you know, what forces was what forces were around at the time? Because used to, it, sometimes it'd be paratroopers, and it was the paratroopers. I mean, you just you couldn't cross them because you know you would get a bit and like. And um, so we we had it. That's how we had it down to a fine art. We knew you know exactly who was there, how difficult it was going to be for us, and how the how how bad the intimidation was going to be. Jesus, light is no wonder when you used to come down, you used to bait the shit out of us below. <laughs> <laughs> come here, Oisin. The last thing I'll, I'll ask before leaving you go. All your former players, and I suppose at club level, do all the former senior players, are they kind of asked to get involved? Right. Are, are, they, are they kind of just kind of, is it like ex-players, you play with Cross McGlynn, get involved at under 12, get involved at under 14, get involved at... Are they, is that the way it's going? Like, is that the way you keep it going, keep it driven? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of players involved. Uh, Tony McIntyre's our coaching officer, and he's made a hell of a, a, he's done a hell of a job. But he's made a hell of a difference. He keeps everybody on their toes. Um, I when I left, left when I yeah when I left the seniors, I got promoted. I went to, straight to the under sixes. Uh, and <laughs> and then the under eights, and now I'm at the under nines. So That's I'm thinking, bank, isn't it? yeah, I'm thinking ten years could be back up to the seniors again. But uh, look, at a lot of lads have have kids involved, so they're going to get involved in that way. But uh, we have so many. The great thing I think about cross now at the minute is not just that we have ex players involved, but we have guys involved now who mightn't have a huge background in football or GA. They are lads who have um, moved into the town and have, have got involved. And uh, the, Cross is, is the sort of place, like, you know, once you're with them, you know, you're very much accepted. And and, and uh, it's great to have all of those gays and all sorts, all gays with different sets of uh, uh, expertise and different things like that, that maybe some of us maybe don't have. And uh, it's it's brilliant to have them because anybody out there who's working with underage teams will know one thing you need is back up and bodies. You yeah. know what I mean? If I go up, <laughs> if I go up, if I go up and there's 36 kids there, <laughs> I, I, I'm looking around me. I, I need some adults there because uh, because oh, it's 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 the lens then. Oh, Sheen, I I really enjoy. It. I could keep. No, going. I really enjoy. I it. could uh, keep going for the night now and make sure there's nobody. When you send that, send an email, right? And invite me up. Don't mention golf, right? Do not mention golf. Like, I'll obviously carry the golf clothes. I'll say there's a gig on. <laughs> there's a gig, yeah. Big money on it. And we'll go up. Uh, we'll play around the golf. I, I honestly would love to come up because very often you go into these places where great tradition and you're looking around 
And I'd love, like, the size of Cross McGlynn, I've heard about it, I just want to see it. I just want to see where, where the, the magic what are you, happens. What, what are you playing off? Playing off a seven. Right. Maybe leave it for a couple of years. <laughs> No, I'm not playing to seven. No, I'm not. I'm not. I play, I, yeah, I play too much of it. Like, I won't say that too loud. So I, I live in a bloody golf course, sir. What else do I be doing? You know? And there's no football, actually, and we have to fill the day somewhere. It's going to be some golf played over the next couple of weeks. Oh, stop. Come here, bye. Thanks a million. I really enjoyed it, Oshin. And regards to all, bye. And I'll talk to you soon. Hopefully, we'll see action this year. Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed it tomorrow. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, bye. Thanks. Yeah, bye. Yeah, bye.